Hello everyone, this is your host Noah Lampert, and this is Synchronicity, that's the name of the show. Um, Before we start today, I have a favor to ask of you, dear listener. Uh, If you could please record yourself on any device saying, this is Synchronicity, and then send that to me. Uh, My email is nlampert at mindpodnetwork.com. Send it to me going to do something cool with it and i would love for you to do that if no one does that i'm going to record a bunch of people and still pretend like you guys did that so you'll never know how popular or unpopular this is uh but i think it's going to be pretty cool so without any further ado i would like to introduce myself introducing my first guest zach leary My first guest today is Zach Leary. Uh, he has his own podcast called It's All Happening Podcast dot com. If you want to go there, um, it's pretty cool. I really recommend checking it out. He has some re- very very awesome guests: uh, Ron Das, Douglas Rushkoff, Trudy Goodman. Just some really cool people. Um, so I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, so Zach is a really interesting dude. He has a lot of, he knows about a lot of different things, yet is a pretty grounded guy, at least from my experiences with him. He's able to kind of move from world to world pretty seamlessly. Uh, he's involved in the Kirtan scene out in LA, uh, which is devotional chanting. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, um, and it is not nearly as weird as you think it might sound, devotional chanting. I uh, had my first experience with that uh, kirtan a couple years ago at a, a Ram Das retreat. It was my first one. Uh, I'd been working with uh, the Foundation Love Server member for about a year and a half, and uh, I went at the behest of my uh, co-worker and boss, uh, Raghu Marcus, uh, over there, and I was really looking forward to it. I mean, it was on Maui. It was like going to be amazing regardless of whatever was going to happen, even though I didn't really know what was going to happen. Um, but I was a little skeptical of the kirtan. I was like, what is, what is this going to be? Like, why why am I going to have to chant things back to people? Is it going to be like a little culty? So I didn't know. And I was definitely a little freaked out. Um, but I went and I had listened to Kirtan, uh, someone who I work with and admire greatly. Krishna Das, um, is you can look him up, has tons of awesome stuff that you can check out on Spotify, iTunes, anywhere, uh, fine digital retailer. Um, you can check it out and it's really great music. It's undeniable, but I still didn't really know what the experience was going to be like. So I went and. And uh, I was, you know, the first the first night they have it, it was Krishna Das. And I was like, holy shit. It's like this A isn't weird at all. B, this is like incredibly awesome. Anyway, I digress. Kirtan is cool. Zach is involved in it. Uh, he's involved in a lot of other cool things. At the beginning of the podcast, you'll hear um, him give a ne- definition for transhumanism, which I asked for explicitly because I didn't know what it meant. I do now. You will af- after listening to it. So uh, without me rambling on anymore, um, here is Zach Leary. Thanks. Just keep your, your audio MIDI set up, the little keyboard thing in your dock, because you can come up with all these different configurations that'll work. Sunflower, um, okay. Yeah, Let's it's a, it's a it lifesaver. Um, we used to use it at school, Berkeley. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, Thanks. that's where I found out about <laughs> it. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, thank you for taking some time to, course, to do man. this in the middle of the week. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't have like any actual format or anything. Um, you're one of my first interviews for this, but I, you know, did some cursory research, um, mm-hmm. you know, and I know we met last year, hung out at the retreat, um, yep. but I was going through your stuff and I have always wondered this and now I actually have the perfect person to ask. 
I saw in your bio on the It's All Happening podcast website, which is your mm. podcast, um, that you're a transhumanist or you consider yourself a, a transhumanist. And uh, that is a fascinating area to me that I actually have very little knowledge about. So I would love to hear what your definition of a transhumanist is and how that kind of like feeds into your life and and what that's about. Yeah. Well, I mean, transhumanism. Well, first of all, let me back up a step. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> like I am a technologist through and through in the sense that I think given all of our current uh, situations and challenges as we're facing in the world today, technology, we're going to have to invent ourselves sort of out of our mess. <laughs> yeah as it were. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I know a lot of people in, you know, the community that I reside in and that you reside in too, and, uh, the, the spiritual community and the yoga community, and just kind of the greater, just to kind of label it a little bit, the generic new age community. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a rejection of technology. There's like, we've got to go back to the earth. We've got to go mm. back to nature. Like all of this being connected all the time. It's not working. We've got to go back, you know? Yeah. And you know, I get the sen the sentiment in that, and I do, and I appreciate what, like, you know, we're losing our connection to, to Mother Earth and, and the importance of that. But at the same time, you know, the train has already left the station. Yeah. You know, yeah. We, we cannot turn back now. So what we have an endless resource of and an endless well of is the power of innovation and the mm -hmm. power of human ideas. Like, that is one thing we have an endless resource up and and i don't ever doubt the power of you know of human potential and how we can kind of create and we back ourselves into a corner and we can figure out ways to kind of get out of that corner so like for instance um we'll get to transhumanism in one second it's a yeah. long answer but, yeah yeah um, sure like like for instance like a very basic example in in los angeles there are a couple one smog in the early 70s um all throughout the 80s until I was growing up in, in Los Angeles, the smog was so awful in LA that you would have what would be called smog days yeah. at, at school. Like we would have, like there were days where we couldn't go outside during recess or PE. Yeah. They would cancel class because the smog was too bad. It's nuts. We have invented a way to, you know, to, through the, you know, cleaner emissions through cars and, and, you know, curbing factory output and stuff where, that has virtually gone away. Mm. A smog day doesn't exist. Mm. I think the last smog day in Los Angeles was in the early 90s. We have to look that up. But it doesn't exist. So we found, we found a solution, and it worked. Um, and the second one is the Heal the Bay in the Santa Monica Bay. When I was growing up in Santa Monica, too, and, and there were days where you could not go in the ocean. You would come <laughs> out with a rash Jeez. all over your body, and it was just a disgusting mess. And the Heal the Bay product, project you know, which was not necessarily a technology project. It was just like an awareness and a consciousness project right. about rerouting sewer lines and, and put, you know, and curbing what you put into sewer lines and not dumping into the ocean. And it just, you know, it worked. Now the bay is, is pretty much, it's clean. Wow. You can go swimming in it. So, I mean, these are just two little examples. So transhumanism to me is really about the adaptation or the augmented reality of the human condition. Mm. Like we can... You know, I'm I'm a I'm a believer in nanotechnology, cool, and 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 bio enhancement, and all of these things. And I don't consider them to be artificial. Hmm. I consider them to be an extension of the human experience. So, if you believe in the most basic terms that human beings are, you know, are an extension of nature or of God of the One, whatever it is, sure. then whatever it is we manifest is just an extension of that. Sure. So transhumanism is just a way to sort of augment our nature hmm. into making a, a better model. Huh. That's uh, never heard it put like that. And that's really, that's very interesting. I have a question. You, you mentioned the bio enhancement because this is, I am guilty, I think, on some level of being one of those kind of new age people who's like, yeah, we got to go back to the earth. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's it's the nature. I like the plant medicines, all of those I am things. Too. I am of too. course, yeah. of course. Yeah. But I also like you. I mean, my job, I'm sitting in front of computer and technology and, you know, these information systems most of my day. So I also realize that there is an amazing power there that can be harnessed and used for good. It's not like something there's always two like 
technology to me is neutral, just like, you know, almost everything is neutral. It's the intent yeah. that goes behind it that defines the outcome that happens. Um, but I, I, I would say, so the bio enhancement stuff is something I've had conversations uh, about with, with several people. And I still, I still get a little weird about it. Like when I, when I hear someone like is implanting something in their brain to regular like glucose so they can like work out for longer or something and have better recovery time. And I know that's kind of like a very, you know, yeah. grotesque version of it. Or I think one of the natural fears, I don't know where it emanates from, maybe sci-fi, is that, you know, we're going to slowly evolve into like these android people who have like, you know, the Borg in, 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 in uh, uh, Star course. Trek or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, too, I mean, a, a peril of it is, of course, there, there could be class warfare around. Right, it, right. That only, you know, rich, well, exceptional right. people. Um, well, there was some recent movie. Which one was it? A uh, sci-fi movie. I think the Matt Damon one with the 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 utopian sort of moon floating over the over the over the earth. Oh, what and was it, I didn't see that. I, I remember that coming out. But yeah. And then down on earth, it was like everybody. Yeah, everyone was. Left, yeah, exactly. Know? It was like a separate society. Yeah, it was like a separate society. And there is I do have fears of that is that, you know, bio enhancement and nanotechnology and making like the perfect, you know, subhuman yeah. species that becomes just this incredible, <laughs> like, you know, perfect Adonis all the time, yeah, yeah. you know, who can speak 10 languages and, you know, and like just, you know, of course, the generic cliche matrix. Exactly. Right, right. I know kung fu. Yeah, you know, all exactly. Of all of a sudden, yeah. So there is that. There is that problem, and I do have that 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 fear of it. Um, you know, but I don't have the fear like, uh, you know, Douglas Rushkoff, who, who's who's my friend, says I'm on team human, mm. and and I like that. So I don't have the 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 fear that, you know, humans are creating a model to make themselves outdated. Mm. Or, or 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 anything like that you know there are there's a lot of interesting things happening you know there's a there's a fund and elon musk is a donor to it that yeah. is um a, a fund generated for to, to to make sure that ai companies make responsible I, artificial i just intelligence. read about this today yes. i was reading about that and i thought it was really interesting and they obviously point out the flip side is is that if any kind of rogue nation or country or corporation decides to go down that route it's like you know then everyone has to it becomes an arms race so it becomes an arms race right? yeah yeah it was uh it was it was yeah i mean that's one of the things that piqued my interest today i it, this goes into something else we can talk about later and the role of facebook and social media and how mm. certain things are kind of implanted in our consciousness at times um which i think is related in a way but yeah the i was reading that exact same thing they're they're really putting into a fund to to make sure that we're approaching this in kind of a conscious way, which I think is really needed. Um, and Absolutely. great. So we don't yeah. great artificial intelligence. That's going to, yeah. that's going to come Skynet. and kill us. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Skynet. That's going to come, <laughs> you know, robots from the future are going to come and kill us and arrest us for our, our sins of the future. Right. Right. Incredibly interesting scenario. Yeah. But I think part of the perils of this and why so many people have so much, so many fears around it is because it's happening so fast. Yeah. Everything. It's like, this idea of you know a future shock and and we have to be prepared for for the you know out the abnormalities of the future and the acceleration of the future is uh, it was once a real concern but the difference is now if you kind of look at that concept is it's it's happening right now yeah like what we refer to as the future yeah it's like this is it yeah yeah this it, is it yeah this is happening right now. And we see with, with, you know, those of us who are old enough to go, you know, before who are around before, say, for instance, social media or smartphones, um, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm a great example. I'm right in that age. Yeah. Range. Of course, I had a, a very full, healthy adult life before social media. But in some ways, like, I can't remember what yeah. it was like. I, I was talking about this the <laughs> other day because I... I grew. Mm -hmm. I was born in '83, so I remember okay. what dial tones sound like. I, I was in a world where you you just didn't have a phone on you all the time. The internet wasn't a thing for my entire life. Um, for most of my childhood, it wasn't. And, and I also had the same experience. Me and my wife were talking about it, where it, it was akin to us getting a dog. Like we remember kind of not having a dog but it seems like we've had this dog forever in our lives and we honestly can't remember and that's what it feels like now with social media and one of the things that really brings this to the forefront for me is that's that my early part of my career was really tied to social media in a big way i mean the the mm. amount of 
ac- the access you had to mass consciousness via social media, especially in the early days where, say, if you ran a Facebook page and had like 100,000 people, you put something up, like 80,000 people are going to see it. That was right. unprecedented. I mean, especially right. for a non-paid advertising route. So it's it's still shifting. It's still dramatically changing. I This, this reminds me of something, uh, just to go into the social media stuff, that... Uh, I think it was like two years ago, maybe longer, that Facebook was running a covert experiment in kind of social engineering to figure out that how people would react to uh, if they started prioritizing negative kind of life events and news events in people's news feeds. And then they did a sample size where some people got negative events and some people got positive events. And then they tracked to see how that influenced their you know consumption on the web, but also what their posts were. And they found, uh, they labeled it as kind of like an innocuous, uh, innocuous kind of, you know, experiment, but they were like, yeah, we found it is very viable to influence, influence people's mindsets just by, you know, showing them stuff on their screen, whether it's even consciously perceived or not, which to me is, I mean, right. mind blowing, obviously considering how much we see in a given day. So, um, yeah. And also, these are also sort of, the, of, of the perils of it. And, you know, in, in a lot of ways, also, also the train has left the station. We can't turn <laughs> back. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of interesting uh, paradigms and movements out there like digital detox. Yes, yes. Uh, which is an important program. And, I, you know, I spend tons of time in, in social media and, and yeah. some parts make my, my living in it as well. Yeah. But, you know, we ha- it's, it's kind of, it's not dissimilar to how, you know, when television came up. Through mm. the months, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, I think by the late 60s, early 70s, the average American household was spending you know, six to eight hours a day in front of the television. Yeah. All of a sudden without any sort of, you know, responsible, you know, any sort of guidelines. Right, right. Yes, the set and setting of television. And it would just (laughs) became this 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 omnipresent thing. Yeah. It was just yeah. And just this 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 life suck. Yeah. And in some ways social media is 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 the same. And the power that Google and Facebook has Mm. with controlling what it is we see and how we are programmed and delivering us the filter that is most applicable to Noah or you know mm-hmm. relevant to Zach, it's very very sta- it, it, it's it's a complicated issue, and I think we really do have to promote responsible and intelligent, healthy uses of of detachment with it as well, so we can find the balance. I I agree, and I I stumbled mm. on something on your website too, ZachLeary.com, where you were talking about six rules for making Facebook a better place, and this is oh, something. Right. Yeah, and this is <laughs> this is something that I've really been interested in for a long time because I at one point wrote an article called, you know, Facebook is uh, basically for narcissists. You know, it's the only reason people (laughs) use Facebook. And it was actually a a relatively well thought out treatise on why Facebook was bad. But then I realized very quickly that yes, there are some aspects that are superimposed and kind of force on you with Facebook. But most of the responsibility lies with the individual these days. And maybe that's not the way it should be, but it is. And you're very responsible. And one of the things you pointed out in your article, which I think is very, very important, is actively go out and seek differing opinions. Um, Go and find media that you wouldn't necessarily, that you don't actually agree with. And I think that not only one of my favorite things about the web, and I think this is a is a concept that's sometimes missed, is it's the same thing as offline. It's a different permutation, but it's the same thing. And in the same way that you recommend kind of going out if you're a liberal, finding some Fox News stuff, finding some things that are not in your mindset. If you do that in life, and you know, you can put this in any permutation you want, you end up learning a lot more. You don't get into your own pigeonhole and straight narrow focus consciousness, which sometimes focus is good. But if you're just getting fed the stuff that you like, are you really changing? Are you growing? And furthermore, is it creating silos of information and group think that are very cut off from other people, which is, I think, you know, yeah. probably it, not a good thing. And yeah. this is the filter bubble, the, yeah. the, the classic book by Eli Parsier, the co-founder of, uh, of Move On is the mm. filter bubble. Um, it was a, sort of an accidental tangent of what happened in, in social media because of the way Google and uh, Facebook are engineered. They are engineered to deliver personalized results. Right. So that sounds great. And early on, that sounded really great because it was great for advertisers and we would get the ads that we like and we would get the content that we like. And that's all fine and well. But basically, what happened, and we're seeing this in a, a, the a supreme manifestation of this problem is the political landscape. Mm. It is so divisive and so polarized. There are very few people in the middle. And a large part of that is because 
you know, if you are a right wing hardcore neocon, you're probably only seeing right wing hardcore yeah. neocon information. You're watching Fox News and 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 your social media and your Google search results is just feeding you all of that. And it's the same for the left as right. well. So yeah, my point was like, and and I try to do it is uh, you know, I interact. I, I like Fox News. I like Rush Limbaugh. Yeah. Uh, and, I, uh, and I like Glenn Beck's pages. I like all of those pages. Yeah. And I kind of now and then I dip in and I interact with them. And it's true. It's changed my Facebook algorithm. Yeah. It shows me stuff yeah. that I normally wouldn't see. But to me, it like you mentioned, like it's the same as the offline world. It is and it isn't. Because mm. like it's much safer to do this experiment online. <laughs> like I'm not about to go to, <laughs> to like an NRA you know, meeting and go I'm like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to go have pizza with the, the local, you know, my cock be for president chapter. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to do it. Yeah. So, you know, social media is much. Yeah, sure. I can yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great point. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, that's true. And, and I do make the parallel that it's the same thing. I think a lot of the, uh, the way we view the web, I mean, it's digitized consciousness. That's one of the first yes. thing that kind of struck me when I was getting into Twitter in like 2007 or 2008 is that normally when people speak, right, they have some filter that says I'm with another person. I have a way to act and I'm going to think things in my head or, you know, there's some there's some dynamic that's set up. But something that that kind of removed that with this news feed kind of stream of consciousness posting is you don't have to verbally communicate it anymore. And I think there's a process that actually dictates kind of social some if you read like someone's tweets right mm. they're they're generally very maybe even if they're the same kind of vibe they're different than the way the person speaks typically absolutely and that yeah. to me is very interesting because it's just showing that not only is this a data sample that we can actually look back and analyze which you can't really do the same way with the human brain but uh i, I just find it Digitized consciousness to me is just such an interesting uh, kind of paradigm because I think in the same ways that ideas and kind of concepts permeate kind of through the ether, not on the web, they, they you can actually track them on the web and see what's going on, which to me is just a fascinating concept. Um, and to see how it co continuously evolves with some kind of meta awareness of what's going on. But like you said, I mean, I think people still think like, oh, in the future, in the future. And you're right. We're in it. We're in this kind of quantum leap exponential kind of change going on. But it's hard to kind of get a grasp on it. Um, I, yeah, I'd love to it, hear your take on it. It is. And it's hard to I, I think it's also hard to represent your life in it. <laughs> you know, what, what you said, and which is so interesting, the way people tweet. Or even post on on Facebook, sure. you know, short term or long term, is very different than how the person sounds in real life. And you know, the, the classic symptom of this to me is that rarely do people post their hardships yeah. or, post, or post their struggles. So true. You know? Yeah, everything is sort of like this glossy, idealized. My life is great. Yeah. Sort of. I don't really have any struggles. Kind of. Kind of. You know paradigm yeah and you know and, and i'm guilty of that too i think you know we all are to some extent and yeah, no, people aren't posting i just had a savage fight with my significant other said so oh. many names that were horrible here's a list of them <laughs> like yeah, i've not seen that we post. should I we agree. absolutely I should agree. you know we, we should and i know you can relate with this and so much of like you know the, the bhakti path and mm. and the yogic mm. path is about that exposure and that awareness to vulnerability about yeah. opening up your heart a little bit and being yeah. more sensitive and compassion and compassionate to the world around us. And I think that really needs to be reflected in how we, you know, display our lives in in Facebook, in Twitter, in in, you know, how is it that we're using the megaphone and like to be vulnerable and to say, look, I really had a shitty day here. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm depressed. I can't get out of bed. W whatever it is. Yeah, you know, yeah. You're having one of those days. Like, you know what I mean? And I that yeah. It's true. I mean, it's it's something that evolves. I think that is right. It's kind of like a persona, right? Everyone has mm. the masks that they wear in everyday life and some not even for, uh, you know, any shady reasons or anything. It's just that everyone has to develop a personality and kind of a, a relationship right. with various things in the world. And the online one is just kind of a step. Not I don't even want to say removed, but it's a different 
different thing and people craft their own personas um and then everyone kind of acts like that's just how it is right you know and right. and there are authentic people i will say i i do know a few people Absolutely. who are actually very real on social media from the good things to the bad things and those are typically my my favorite follows like i uh, i always famously give people a hard time on social media especially on my twitter i only follow like 70 75 people and sometimes people will like weirdly overtly ask me for a follow and i'm like no like here's the thing <laughs> there's two ways i look at this like i'm kind of a dick about it yes but also i really am very i'm very protective about what I know that I'm looking at Twitter 20, 30 times a day. I know I'm on Facebook 10, 15 times a day. I, for that reason, I do want to be somewhat responsible and protective of what I allow in um, kind of my own filter bubble in a way. And I don't want to just, you know, push away everything that's bad. But I definitely am cognizant that if you're following, you know, a thousand people on Twitter and you're actively going through your feed, you're not seeing everything, but who knows what's coming in through there? And that to me is is one of the the biggest kind of things that I, I don't think people really focus on. Like this, all of this stuff, just like advertising in the world. Like if you're walking down the street and a bus comes across, you know, and it says drink Coke or whatever it is, even if you don't consciously register it, somewhere in your brain is picking this up. This is This is one of the things that always interested me so much about psychedelics. When I first started doing psychedelics when I was, 15 and from then on psilocybin and lsd primarily i started getting a glimpse i think Rondas calls it the witness right the observer consciousness this kind of thing that's detached from your regular personality but there's still an awareness there and i started kind of seeing all these little things underneath what were going on i'm like wow this stuff is actually happening all of the time. Just because I didn't consciously pick up on that sound doesn't mean it wasn't filed somewhere in my brain. And that relationship to the web to me is is just fascinating and relatively unexplored. I think there are probably advertisers and big corporations mm. who are looking at this stuff, but from an individual standpoint, I think that that's somewhat lost. I don't, I don't know. What what do you Yeah, think? I mean, you've got to control your own reality. And yeah. that's the great thing about uh about the about the web and all digital technologies is that you can fine tune it enough to really control your own reality and to create, yeah. like you said, your own filter bubble. And the biggest, you know, not now and then there, I still have a, a, a few friends left who are God like who the, the biggest complaint they say is God, my Facebook is so lame. All I see is <laughs> stupid cat pictures and like <laughs> stupid news stories. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, sorry, I don't mean to be mean, but maybe you need to control who it is you add as a yeah, friend that's that's the you biggest know? thing yeah. and hide them unfollow them if they just post you know too many stupid cat pictures all the time I, yeah it's it, and you can really control like the tools are there to control your own reality con to control your own content bubble and filter bubble to what you're taking in the advertising gets a little sticky because that's yeah. not as you know you don't have control over that as much but you do as far as content yeah. And I think that's yeah. important. I mean, I, I like a, probably a lot of people. Um, I use an ad blocker now on, on oh, almost exclusively. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, uh, I purposely don't want to see ads. It, it's kind of the same logic. And I, and I don't know if this is correct or not, but I really, really, really used to be into like cable news and politics. I protested sure. outside of the Supreme Court here in D.C. when Al Gore didn't win the election because of the recount. I was out there at the Supreme Court. And, you know, half of it was probably I wanted to miss a school day, but I actually really cared. Right. After that, 2000, 2004, my relationship kind of with the political world and news world changed where I stopped seeing it kind of as like an information source is where a lot of our parents probably relied on the, the nightly news or the newspaper to get information as to kind of like something that's trying to feed me a narrative of how the world is that I don't really find that productive. And so I'm always kind of I haven't watched news. I don't even have cable anymore. I haven't watched it in like a year and a half, two years. And I've noticed, I don't know if this is naive or not, but I've noticed my general outlook on life and what's going on in my day to day seems a little bit lighter. It doesn't seem as heavy um, with kind of getting inundated with all of this other stuff. Now, that doesn't mean that if I see an article that's compelling, that's how I rely on social media now. I have friends who I trust. I trust their viewpoints. Right. I trust, and I see when they post something maybe about ISIS, which I'm not actively seeking information on, but I know that they're not just putting this up as some like inflammatory thing, but they're actually putting it up for a reason. Um, then I, that's how I get my news. That's, how I, that's truly news, right? how I get my news. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's a, that's a good method. I mean, at least you're getting get, get the news, you know, in, in some way or some form, even if it comes through social recommendation or just, you know, peer to peer feeding news through you know, peer to peer networks. And, and, and that's a really interesting way to do it. But I am of the, of the belief and sort of that you, you have to get your news in some way, yeah. shape or form. And that's another, um, gosh, I, I feel like I've said this 10 times, but that's another <laughs> bone I have to pick with the greater new age community. Yeah. And, and I really hear that a lot. Um, you know, it, it just like, oh, you know, I just can't, I can't tune into the news just because I'm so sensitive and I just don't want to, I don't want to know about that. And it just ruins my whole reality. Yeah. And to me, like, I feel like that's an irresponsible way to live oh, because like the problem is, you know, you have to be, you can't hide your head in the sand anymore. Mm -hmm. You can't just like, you know, if your entire life is just inside of this self-created bubble, you know, and you're denying the reality of what your brothers and sisters are going through in mm. wherever it is, you know, Middle East, North Korea, you know, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, yeah. like all the, the problem regions of the world. You know, you're denying the reality of the human experience. Mm. We have to know what our brothers and sisters are doing. Granted, you know, I don't need to walk, wake up in the morning first thing and turn on, <laughs> you know, the, the television and just get fed this. Yeah, this, set your whole day up. Right, and right. And it's somewhat, you know, insanely biased and saccharine news experience that we're being fed all the time. Right. But, like, we have to pick and choose. Like, you know, one of my favorite things when, when hanging out with RD at, at, at the house is that he looks at the paper every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. You know, it's an old school thing. I mean, he was built, but born in nineteen. Built. He was born in nineteen thirty one. But you yeah. know, and that's an old school thing. Is you get the paper and you look at the yeah. paper. It sits there and eats his breakfast and looks at the paper. Yeah. And it's not. It's just a little ritual of just kind of tuning in to like, oh, okay, this is happening and this is interesting that this is happening and here's why it is. Well, it. it it's you know? true. And it deals with this, this the Buddhist concept, right, of grasping and aversion, right? I think oh, that, right. that what that. you're talking about is the aversion, yeah. right? That people want to create their own reality to detach. Like, because they're, oh, I'm not attached, but they're actually actively detaching, which is a form yeah, of don't aversion. don't deny the aversion. So Detach I, from it. There's exactly. A it's a very big difference, but it's yeah. also one that I think can be, you know, when you start waking up to how much suffering it, there is around the world. I mean, I don't think it's a completely insane reaction to try to shut off from that. I mean, you, you most people aren't going to lean into it, although I think that's probably what you should do. Uh, but it's it's just a natural thing. So I have a quote I found because I want to do these quotes. I, if anyone knows me on social media, I, I'm a big fan of putting quotes up. And I think some you people did, think I- did an I, Aldous Huxley thing today. Yeah, I did an Aldous Huxley yeah. one. This is a different quote from the other day. Um, and I like these quotes for a couple of reasons. One, I think if you wake up and just kind of toss a quote around in your mind throughout the day, you'd just be surprised how it can interact in different different ways, little synchronicities. Um, and also, I just think it's smart. Like, you know, try to, these people, these, these are quotes and they're, they're, they're sayings and wisdom that I at least try to pick out that have some personal meaning. I mean, there's a lot in this day and age of social media, right? There's people put up quotes for everything. They're misattributed. They're, you know, kind of just, you can tell they're just platitudes. But I, I do think there's still value in and tossing over uh, words of wisdom. So here's a quote. Uh, it's from Marie-Louise von Franz, who was a, a Jungian analyst, worked with Carl Jung in anthropology. She was great. Amazing. She goes, it's easy to be a naive idealist. It's easy to be a cynical realist. It's quite another thing to have no illusions and still ho hold the inner flame, which to me is a, an amazing quote because I've experienced both sides of those things. I think I would say I started most of my life as a cynical realist, you know, thinking I had a very good idea of what's going on. Oh, look at that. That's not as smart as it could be. Oh, this is the world's all messed up. Right. And then I had a very dramatic shift into a naive idealist. Everything is love, but not in like a, a thinking way, but everything is love in a, oh, everything is great. There's no problems in the world. If I don't think about the problems, they don't exist. And then you kind of, I had this balancing thing, and this is no way to say that I have it all figured out in any way, shape, or form, but I've now approached difficult situations in the world, in life, with a bit more balance and not just kind of push away or grab onto this pleasant experience. And I found that to be amazingly transformative. Um, I don't know, it, it doesn't happen right away, but over time, I think... 
if you can be aware of the the differences, the idealist stuff and the realism of the world, it really does transform your life in a positive way. Um, and so how do you find that balance? I mean, that's, that's the trick. I mean, that's yes. the practice, right? Yes, that is the practice. And yeah. <laughs> I would love to say that that balance is uh, once you find it, it stays, but it doesn't. I mean, those are the waves, that, right? I, I think I put up another uh, Ken Kesey quote the other day, which was, you know, you have to, the, the goal isn't to not engage with the world. It's you have to go in to the world and ride the waves of the world. And that's, that's, yeah. that's been my experience of life. I don't know. I don't know if someone else has kind of a plateau experience, but it's up and down, up and it, down, up and down. Yeah. I was, I was talking with Jack Cornfield not that long ago, just about some, some personal kind of stuff that I was going through. Yeah. And, you know, he put it in relationship to the larger to the world at large is that, you know, you, you descent up the mountain and you can attain these, you know, these pearls of wisdom or, or the nectar or whatever language you want to use from any tradition and ascending up the mountain. Yeah. But you have to descend. Yeah. To, yeah. What goes up? Yeah. Yeah. You've got to go up and just kind of ride these waves or, you know, the, the classic Buddhist thing, the, the world is a. Uh, an ocean of joy and a sea of tears. Yeah. You know, it's, it's both simultaneously. It's both, yeah. all, it's all happening at once and, and, and simultaneously all happening. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I, I go into those zones so often <laughs> being a cynical, yeah. Realist, yeah. you know, it's like, what difference does it make? Yeah. It's like the entire government's bought and sold exactly. in a way. And it's just one big corporation. Right. All of these people are clowns. So what difference does it make? You know, let's just forget it, you know, but you, it, that's too convenient. It's yeah. too simple. It doesn't work. It doesn't feel right either. I think if you yep. if you stay in that zone after a while, you, you begin to notice, at least I did, that it creeps into your own own being too. If you, that's how you're into, viewing. Yeah, yeah. It creeps into your own being and also part of it, which I, I go on this thing all the time that, especially as you get into the political arena, or the, not even just pol the political arena, but just the kind of the bigger social issues mm. arena, is that we're all complicit. You know, we're all part of the problem and we're all part of the solution. Mm. And even the most like, you know, idealistic, progressive and really like action oriented, you know, progressive person out there, you know, they're doing the best that they can and and leading by example. But we're still complicit. We're all part of the of problem. Course. I put gas into my car yeah. today. I pay taxes into this machine. Mm. I live in this constructs of, of these walls of the material world around me and I pay rent and I live in a <laughs> city. And it's, yeah. you know, it's all part of this, this reality that's in, you know, I, I, I bank and maybe I'm ashamed to say it, but I bank with a major banking institution <laughs> Me too, that, sir. you know, was, yeah, was part of, you know, the, the wall street meltdown and all of that. And, you know, so we're all sort of complicit in it mm. to a degree. We're all paying money into the problem. Yeah. So if, if we could just admit that and stop admitting that we live outside of the bubble, unless you're part of the, you know one in a gazillion people who lives truly off the grid and right. doesn't subscribe to any of this shit. But that is, that, that's so rare. So once we sort of admit our complicitness, you know, then we can dance in and out of the solution with a little bit more ease and, you know, e e ease of speech and ease of, ease of action yeah. and, and ease within the choices we're making as well. And that's, that's, that's where it starts and just the choices we're making. Yeah. And I think that's, that's important, you know, acknowledging, it, it sounds like you know, one of the things you're touching on, which I think is really important is, is acknowledging what's going on. This is yeah. something yeah. I, I, I'm a big Carl Jung fan, so you'll hear me talk about him mm. a lot, but cool. one of his concepts that I love is the shadow, um, this alternate kind of, this is the dark aspect of our personality that most of us truthfully don't really like to face. It comes out when we get angry or frustrated or whatever it is, but it exists in all of us. And uh, it's typically unconscious. And I think actively trying to, to examine that and acknowledge that, that, that that's a part of all of us really then promotes change in, in a positive way. I, I don't well, think that you, I think a fear is yes. if you acknowledge the shadow aspects of yourself or personality or whatever you've done. And everyone's done fucked up shit. Everyone's had fucked up shit happen to them. That's yeah. called life for everyone, truthfully. Um, but when you start kind of examining it in yourself, it, there's less constriction and tension around it. And I think that's one, one concept I really love about Buddhism is this concept of space and creating enough space in your own head, in your life, in your, it's one of the most important concepts to me because 
I just think things get a little bit easier when it's not mm -hmm. the most important thing in the world. That's like for me, when I get angry, that's why I get angry. I, I rarely, rarely can notice it in the moment, but it, usually when I'm angry, or I'm yelling or I'm screaming, it's because <laughs> I'm, I'm either af afraid of something deep down that I didn't know or I'm frustrated and I feel tight and constricted like there's no way out like a prisoner. And then afterwards, immediately, once you cool down, you're like, oh, my God, I'm like, what did I do? Like, I'm Why like, did I do that? <laughs> did I, that, that was the reaction. That was not what I was trying to do. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, I definitely think that that acknowledgement aspect of what you're talking oh, about is I just, hugely I mean, important. That's beautifully said. I'm glad you, you touched. I mean, that's the you know, the story of, of, of my life, mm. you know, because I've, I've had a lot of, um, you know, shadow work, mm. I guess, as it were, kind of come to the surface in ways that have been maybe slightly higher than average than sure. most people sure. and sure. around specific issues and substance abuse stuff. And sure, sure. that's really, um, you know, the plane crashed into the mountain, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, in, in major, major ways. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I've definitely been at the precipice to where like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to have to make a choice here. Either I'm going to go on this way and, and might not make it. Mm. And I ha so I have to acknowledge my shadow side and mm -hmm. forgive myself and, and go back into the love and the forgiveness and yeah. the awareness to get out of it. Yeah. To get in, to get out. Absolutely. That's, 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 that's absolutely true. No, and, the, and the Jungian work that you're talking about is, is of vital importance. I, I just, I'm always interested and, and your dad was a part of this too. I'm interested in people and movements that bridge kind of these two worlds, which is probably yeah. a little too simplistic, but the East and West, the esoteric, the, the pragmatic, those types of I've just noticed, even just from like, you know, something as simple as web analytics, that's the stuff on the web, at least for the the networks that I help run and manage, that's the stuff that people respond to the much because there's it's the internal and the external. It's this dichotomy, mm. this play that when it gets kind of brought to the surface a little bit, that's really when stuff starts to happen. Like synchronicity. Everyone knows synchronicity. Mm. Like that's a term that almost anyone is familiar with. A lot of people don't know. Carl Jung came up with it and he calls it, I love his definition of it. He calls it uh, a principle of a causal orderedness. So there is actually a weird orderedness that just doesn't have like a causal thing, which is actually exactly how quantum physics works. When you start going down to the quantum level, there's not like a A goes to B and that's it. If, if there's two particles and one goes in another direction, but they're linked in another, they're linked forever throughout time and space. And, you know, the, the observer principle, it's, it's all very related, which I love. Okay. I want to yeah. move on because I have some questions for you okay. um, uh, that I want to get to. Uh, personally, like you mentioned, you know, how do we, how do we get this balance, right? Mm. What are some things that you do? I know you do Kirtan. Um, I know that you're kind of in a similar community to me, the Satsang, the, the, the Maharaji Neem Karoli Baba Satsang. Um, but what are some things you do that have helped you in your life kind of shift your perspective or just help you in any way? That's well, in the last few years or, you know, like several, six, seven years or whatever, um, having some daily sadhana, mm. you know, some daily practice mm. and forcing yourself to engage into <laughs> that, that daily practice. Um, for me, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I sing, I do kirtan, but I also have a, a formal meditation practice, Good for you. um, which I do most days, uh, you know, some days I, I, I skip it, but most days I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty good about it. Um, and you know, one little uh, ingredient to success, which I'm finding in that, and it's, uh, something I learned from, from Tim Ferriss, you know, Tim mm, Ferriss mm -hmm. is, is really, really big on, on the daily routine mm. issue. And he has some really great raps about how to balance technology and how to incorporate technology into your life. Like he has some very strict rules about when to even look at your email. I, you're talking to. about, so I did this. You're talking yeah. about the, I actually set this up, I'll admit, two months ago where I was gating basically when I was checking my email, I had an autoresponder up that basically told people if they were emailing me at a certain time that I wasn't going to respond because I only checked twice a day. So mm. I left that up for about a month and a half and it worked really well and that space started happening. But then for some reason I got sucked back in you and get sucked I, back I got in. sucked right back in. And, and it is tough. And like, and I love that. And he, and he's right. And Tim is totally right in the mm. sense that nearly every email that I get, not all of them, but almost every one that I get, it's an ask. Yeah. It's somebody asking something yeah. from you or to perform something or to yeah. do something. 
And so one thing that I've incorporated in is, uh, you know, I don't, I don't look at it before my morning meditation, mm. which has really changed. It's helped mm. me create balance in, in, in such a, because if you do look at it when the first thing when you wake up, you take it into your sitting practice. Yeah. You, you can't help it. Yep. All the alarms of the day just go off. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> And the, no, cli- and, the clients yeah. that I have and just it's <laughs> yeah. all happening yeah. and you know and I, I and, and I don't want to know so that that's one good good thing that I've done but um yeah so I mean a, a morning a morning sitting practice has, has helped me to uh you know f- find that balance and singing kirtan and creating a mm. morning morning sadhana but uh you know the most important element for me and you know by no means am I a accomplished spiritual giant of any kind but it's to um it's just to stay in motion mm. what do you mean by elaborate elaborate like just keep going like you know one of the the great um if not the best um sort of 12-step cliche is that you know they say keep coming back and the principle behind that is that you just keep doing things. Mm. You just keep coming. You just keep doing things until something changes. Mm. So, you know, for me, the biggest enemy in life is if you're like, you know, you have a really shitty day and you stay in bed and you eat ice cream and you watch <laughs> Seinfeld reruns for the umpteenth time. You just described like <laughs> last <laughs> month of my life. <laughs> right. And and, and, and and that's it. And it's just like this hellacious thing that I've repeated a million times over and over. And I'm just going down the rabbit hole and I know where the rabbit hole goes. And I'm... And I'm there and the blinds are closed. And it's like, oh my God. <laughs> but if you just kind of stay in motion and keep mm. doing things and and you and just, you know, perform little actions, even in the mundane, you know, it's uh making your bed, taking your car to get washed, or you know, whatever it is, playing with the cat, going outside for a walk, or going for a hike, or talking to friends. Eventually these things kind of catch up and help to, mm. you know, make improve upon life for me i'm an isolationist yeah. you know that's my my go-to my default my default thing you know yeah. i'm a I, I grew up an only child in a in a very complicated household that mm. was uh kind of forced me to grow up probably a little too quickly bad sound alert bad sound alert hello listener you may have noticed that there's some digital interference creeping in on my microphone uh if you haven't Notice that you will because it gets pretty pronounced. Um, If you can stick through it, great. Uh, If not, no problem. Um, I'll catch you soon on another episode. But I do encourage you to listen because there's some good stuff that Zach talks about in the end here. Um, Thanks a lot. And now back to the show. So when I was a kid, I was just this isolationist. Mm. Video games and toys in my corner and making Star Wars fortresses. (laughs) So, you know, a lot of that has kind of stuck with me. It's just, you know, I want to go in the corner and still run and hide. So, yeah. you know, I just do everything I can to avoid that. What you're reminding me with the, the keep going thing, it sounds kind of like one of the paramitas, the six paramitas, the six mm. perfections, which is diligence, which is kind of just continuing to do what needs to be done. It's, it's staying on the scene, you know, not yeah. losing. And, and I think faith is involved in there too, because, you know, that's one of the things that can help us to keep going, knowing that, that it's not for nothing, that things do happen. And I think that's kind of a, an experience that's borne out over time. I Chop mean, wood, carry water. Yeah, there you go. There Before you go. enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry exactly. water. All there you go. can do is show up and do it. Oh, I love it. Um, yeah. oh, all right, I have one last thing because I want to, because we go pretty deep on this stuff, but I want to ask you, is there anything in popular culture or kind of that you're into right now or have recently been into uh, TV show, movie, music, anything going on um, that you're, you're digging? <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, music wise, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely at the moment, which is a weird thing for me. Um, I've, I'm completely the wrong guy to ask <laughs> I, uh, on my umpteenth millionth, uh, kind of grateful dead face <laughs> um, because of, you know, all the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. fairly well stuff. So I just got right back into that and I'm somewhat tuned out on, on new music for the moment. Sure. Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't mean like it has to be new. I, I personally am a believer that like I'll go in and find like a David Bowie album that I've never heard and be like, this is the best thing ever, and just talk about it like it's ever. new. <laughs> like everyone, you know, I was not everyone not talking about Aladdin Sane all the time. What's going on? <laughs> and it is a great album. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing about the, and I just want to 
about the Grateful Dead thing, and which I'm really experiencing lately, and a lot of my friends are, is like uh, when we were around seeing the Grateful Dead, you know, mm. back in the late '80s and early '90s, and all of that. It it feels like it's like now it's like this vindication, <laughs> like all of a sudden, like you know, even Pitchfork, like the most yeah. snobby <laughs> indie music, just like rag that just hates, pretty much hates <laughs> classic rock. Yeah, yeah. Gave the Fare Thee Well concerts a really glowing, wow. pretty sweet review, and it's like you know when I, when we grew up, everybody hated the Grateful Dead. <laughs> you know, it was just like unless just the the core Dead heads. Dead heads, so, yeah. Yeah. So there's that. Um, I um, what else pop culture wise? I love what um, John Oliver is doing. Yeah. And, and How great is he? I, he's oh he's amazing, God. and uh, and the Vice guys. You know, mm. I think. That is an amazing shift in in pop how pop culture is 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 changing our news form mm. and changing the way that you know we we consume this 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 narrative of what some people think is happening out in the world. Um, you know, both of those guys. It's just it's amazing what they're doing and the stories they're telling them and how and how they tell them. Love cool. it. Cool. All right. Um, you know, I'm. You know, I'd like to have you on again because this was awesome and time flew, and we didn't even touch on some other connections. Like we both went to Berkeley School of Music. There's other lots of cool stuff going on, so I'm definitely gonna have you on again. But just thank you for coming. I mean, this is uh, this is great. Thank really you, Noah. Yeah. Great to see you. Greetings, Earthlings. I'm going to start that over because that is lame. So let's talk about some of the ways you can help support. Not me. I don't really need the support. I appreciate it. If you would like to, uh, you can get in touch with me. There's plenty of things I like and enjoy, and you can fund my life. But I don't actually need it. So what I would like you to do if you like this podcast or you're just kind of into uh, stuff that can help you... Uh, yeah, because everyone could use some help. Um, you can support this podcast and a lot of other podcasts by going to mindpodnetwork.com. Um, and there you'll find a plethora of really, really awesome podcasts from some really cool teachers, some non-teachers, just cool people. Um, and I encourage you to delve in and take a listen. And I think you might like it. Um, I think some of you will be listening to this and already know about MindPod Network. So this is a gentle reminder that you can go there and support in a variety of ways. Uh, it doesn't have to be financial. You can just spread the word, let someone know. Um, and that would be awesome. It really helps uh, the whole effort. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, my little spiel here. And uh, thank you again for listening. All right. Bye-bye.